Um, hi, I'm Amber Greener. I'm with All Things Open and today as your moderator, but I'm also leading this session on planning and running online and in-person events. So there's several different ways that you can join the conversation. You can add, uh, you can ask your question or comment and chat. You can put it in the Q&A or as everybody is joining, I am promoting you to panelists. You can unmute. Uh, your audio and your camera, and you can join the conversation that way. Um, while we're getting started here, um, and you know, getting, uh, you know, we can. I was mentioning this earlier. We can talk about many different things when it comes to online and in-person events, but. I'd like to know sort of what you all would like to get out of this, um, and what areas you would like to talk about. I believe uh, the link to the Google Doc um, where we can take notes notes uh, as a whole because I can't take notes and talk so I'll have to rely on you all um, you know is uh, in the chat so if you can add that uh, as we start talking but please let me know um, what you'd like to get out or what your questions are so um, um, uh, Amber yes. I'm just going to make a comment on the all things open launch for your event it's going to the other track and someone talking about incentives um, so I don't know how you interact with him, but you need to have him put the launch for this one in his chat. I just okay. launched the thing for the things that Samantha ran to get back here. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're definitely aware of the issue, which is why we went ahead and started the session about five minutes uh, later, but we don't want to cut into the talk. So we're just going to get started. And as people come through, um, just let people know in the chat and welcome them from Jonah's talk. Sounds good. Um, uh, yeah, let's. To Amber's question about what some things that, that would be helpful for me, um, I come at this from a bit of the technical side in terms of like how to, you know, uh, do a lot of the back end things. Uh, manage getting CFPs and and you know even doing some of the AV stuff which I'm happy to talk about uh, but I'd be interested to see uh, a little bit about how do we make events stand out these days because it, it the the it's good and bad that the the barrier to entry to host a, a conference or an event uh, or in any kind of community event uh, has been lowered significantly but with that has opened the floodgates where it seems as though there's always, some virtual event happening. Um, and so some of that as a, as a viewer is overwhelming, uh, but as a, a conference organizer, it becomes difficult to connect with an audience and say, you know, this, this, this is uh, something that maybe you specifically might be interested in. So I'd, I'd love to hear uh, ideas and, and maybe uh, some other, you know, ways that we can kind of organize that and, and uh, deconflict and, and get ourselves out there a little bit better. Perfect. Um, can one of you all, um, let's see, let's see. I needed to get a message to Todd, but I don't have the link um, to it, the other session because I've been moderating. So I'm trying to multitask here. So I, I apologize if it seems like my head. Is them blink here. Yeah. So Jono just needs the link to send yep. them here. Can you I'll, maybe I'll drop right over back. there and then thanks. Appreciate it. So how do how do most of you all start? Like, do you just say, I want to have an event and you just go out and pick a date and a venue? Or do you actually have I have a checklist, but I, and I said I would give it at the end of the day. Um, how do you um, look at uh, planning your event? And two, if anybody's converted like we did last week, converted an in-person event to a um, virtual event, um, what did you have to do to do that? Or would you like more information on that? Okay, so I mean, I can speak up. I'm, I'm very involved in what are called hybrid events. Um, hybrid events is when you have some people uh, meeting, but then, you know, 95% are uh, virtual. Um, and this started happening mm -hmm. in April in Los Angeles with a lot of entertainment related uh, technology events and has continued. Uh, the major thing is keep it the same night. Um, don't start moving if you have a, if it's always the second Tuesday of the month, don't decide it should be the third Tuesday of the month, or God forbid, it should be at one in the afternoon instead of seven at night. 
Um, but the checklist is the same. The biggest key is that if you've got people entering virtually who are going to speak, make sure they have good sound. So I've got a decent light behind me on a home today. Um, I should be in a lit up space if I have to present. I should be on something better than my webcam video. Uh, and my, my, I have a good microphone that you can't see, but it's down on my desk at the moment. Um, but these are things that are basic and there's a lot of information for hybrid events out there. Amber, if you've got some, I think sharing it in your Google Doc would be really good. And I will get into that before the session is over and add some links. Perfect. So Aaron, it looks like you're in here like five different times. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect that's because I put my link down. And so everyone's probably joining with my name. I apologize okay. for that. So the, those folks who are joining um, who say that um, your name is Aaron Soto, you can go into the participation or the participants list, click on your name and change your name um, that way. Um, also, otherwise, I'll be I would referring to do it the correct way, which is to go back to the schedule and just launch one of the other talks in track two, which will bring you back to this room, but as yourself, in case you don't want to steal my identity. Uh, <laughs> but I, I volunteered myself for this. I brought this on myself. So, uh, well, here we are. Aaron, we're going to need your credit card number for that. Uh, ask any, any number of the other Aaron Sotos. They'll be glad to help you out. So, it, it, so we, we've, we've talked about how to make, uh, one of the questions was how to make your events stand out, the, the hybrid events were in this new, this new, I'm not going to say the word, this, this, the way we have to do things now, um, you know, it looks like um, there's going to be some in-person and some, you know, remote participation options options going forward like how do you how do you look at that um anything else um that people are hoping to um, get out of this session and i apologize for the confusion um all things open had john and i switched back and forth and then both links went to john's session so you know we're all learning how to do this together there's going to be hiccups and it's how you handle those hiccups that really just keep the ball rolling so we're just going to keep talking about that stuff. And at the end of this, when we do the wrap up session this afternoon, I'll actually put a checklist in. So one of the things that I think a lot of folks forget to do when it comes to your events, people go, oh, we wanna have this event, great. And then they go out and they pick a date and then they find a venue. But what they don't ask is often, why? What is the mission statement for this event? Why are you doing that event? Um, and who are you hoping, what's your audience? like? And then people also, while you know it in the back of your mind, you probably don't always think about it, but you know, what, why do people attend event, events? And there's usually two reasons why people attend events. And that is an education side of it and a networking side of it. And usually for um, companies, they attend events to grow their business. So even though there's a lot of little things that fall underneath all its categories, it's usually education and networking for you as an individual and then um, to grow your business as an organization. So the why is really important. So your mission statement and your target audience and making sure that your events um, appeal to both the individual and the organization, especially when you're trying to sell sponsorships, if it's free, that's a, you know, uh, different, uh, different animal there, but uh, but especially when it comes to sponsorships, any thoughts on that or like any mistakes that maybe someone made early on? I know when I first started doing this 15, 20 years ago, when I was in the hotel industry, um, we would just do events and we would put them on. But I, then when I started learning to ask the client, like, why do you want to do this? How can we make your event better? That sort of led into, um, you know, where we are, where I am today. But what about you? Any thoughts on um, that particular piece of the planning part of it. I think a little bit of, of it is the who, but also, I mean, trying to figure out like what what is the, you know, not only the mission statement, like the why, but like who is the person who we're, we're targeting, who, the, who should be coming to this event. And so I notice a lot of times events will have, uh, you know, a mix of introductory uh, type talks and then some, you know, headline type talks that are a little more advanced. And I'm thinking probably a little more technical, uh, but but things that if you're an introductory person, it's daunting, it's overwhelming. Um, 
And so, uh, for example, one of the conferences that I really enjoyed working with was one called IntroSecCon. And it was all about, uh, for those that are introducing themselves to information security. And it was a platform both for, uh, for people who are just getting started to present, but also for people just getting started to see people who were not too dissimilar from themselves, who are just learning the ropes and maybe just a few steps ahead of them. Uh, and so in that, I think, uh, I think that conference was a success because we did a very good job at targeting the who uh, and saying, if you're just starting out, this is the place for you. There's no egos, there's no, uh, uh, no, nothing to, to, to make you feel uh, you know, like you don't belong. Um, so in addition to the, your question of why, I would say uh, who should be uh, attending ideally. Uh, this is a key question. Any other thoughts from folks? Just out of curiosity, uh, maybe, I don't know how we're going to do this, but unmute uh, or just say, raise your hand in the, uh, the chat. How many folks here have actually planned an event or first, you know, how many folks ha have planned an event? Um, yeah. Um so my main day job is actually uh, for a scientific conferencing company that serves primary scientists. And uh, our job is to keep peer review going and like the science must go on, right? COVID happened and we had international events all over the world. Uh, we were running 65. And uh, then when COVID happened, uh, the company needed to pivot <laughs> all 65 meetings, uh, which kind of became like this massive gargantuan task. And uh, I'm going to be honest, like we just man hour brute forced it, which really honestly felt a bit toxic uh, for the company. And we hadn't really proved that the virtual event system that we had developed for one event was actually capable of scaling. Uh, which created this massive problem for us where we had four people in marketing who are all familiar with the tools well enough to run 65 events. And then we had 36 other people in the company who had nothing to do. So how do we manage that uh, when there are 65 events and you just don't have proof enough to scale? So one of the things and, and that Aaron and I kind of looked at when we were both planning our CTFs that we do and our, um, our conferences and stuff was, what do we already have that people know how to use? What, how can we link things together and not expand cost? Or um, like all things open, uh, Todd was saying to most of the speakers that, Hey, they didn't want to bring in another, yet another tool where somebody had to read documentation and learn and, 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 it might go wrong. I mean, we're seeing hiccups today and I would much rather be with my session than one of the other main sessions where the hiccups happen. But, um, and so one of the things that we do is look at what, what we already had and what people could do. And we sort of went with, we, we went with Zoom for all the people who were speaking. So everybody who was a, a speaker had the Zoom link and then we live streamed to YouTube. And if people want to join the conversation, they join the conversation on Slack. So it was no additional cost whatsoever. So everybody could still join in and nobody had to learn anything, anything new. So depending on your budget, like you could, you could definitely, you know, spend a hundred K plus on, on a system or develop it in house and how many ever engineering, you know, how much engineering debt that takes on um, to develop something in house. But if you already have it, that's a tool that you, that you already have and you don't have to reinvest in it. So I don't know what everybody's, you know, budgets are looking like or what you're looking to do in, in 2021. But one of those things is look and take stock of what you already have um, and see what you can make make work and depending on like how polished your event needs to be or what your community um you know is, is looking for or their expectations you can do a lot um you know with a with a little um and, and we've learned that um through trial and error um in, in that aspect the other thing is uh aaron you were talking about making things you know stand out um, one of the things that we did with our talk is, is cybersecurity conferences, and you can look across the board, you know, the biggest one being um, what um, 
uh, black hat with, with DEF CON. So that that's the, uh, you know, the, the biggest ones, you know, that are out there, but we're smaller um, with, with more, you know, a very niche community uh, as one aspect of it. And so we needed to figure out a way to really bring in those user stories and those people using the data um, and not just the developers. So we had, a, you know, we took a, a kind of a playbook from uh, OpenStack back in the day where you had your developer conference and then you had your user piece of it and, um, you know, sort of divided it up that, that, that way. So we had training, which made us stand out and then the user piece and then the developer piece. So what about you all? How would you um, take a look at your events and make them, you know, really stand out in, in the vertical that you're in? Uh, it looks like, uh, Chelsea, are you wanting to speak? You were lit up there for a minute. No, I had just joined, so I was muting my, oh, okay. my microphone again. <laughs> All right, just want to make sure I don't want to miss anybody. So any, any points on um, making your event stand out? We, um, I wrote in chat that uh, we had two large, large-ish in-person events um, that we just expanded from one to two within a year, one in London, one in New York, um, and then COVID hit like everybody else. And we, we pushed, we wanted to have kind of a meetup feel to what we were doing. And so, I mean, it may sound kitschy, but one of the things that we try to do is give away t-shirts um, or, or something to make it, you know, they're, they're half hour virtual meetups. We try to have Q and A as much as possible. Um, but we, you know, because we're calling it a meetup, we want it to feel like that. And so every in-person meetup that we did, so we do like one large event, but then um, I think about six meetups per year either in New York or in London. Um, and we just wanted that feel and, um, and trying to make it as, I mean, I'm in, you know, open source technology within financial services, which is one, a real niche, but two, a real pain in the butt sometimes as far as getting people to participate because of the closed nature of what, of what happens in financial services. Um, so, but I've always gone back to, and I actually, I actually helped Todd start all things open eight years ago. And one of the things that we always used to have a talk about was like, you know, like the people, you know, we're marketing to companies, but we're really marketing to people and people want to enjoy things. People, you know, want things people, you know, people are, are who going to be, or who is going to be at the events, not always just, you know, companies. So, it doesn't matter if they come from a financial services company that is locked down and can't do open source, maybe can only do inner source. We want the people that are there that, you know, they're developers, they're marketers, they're, you know, whomever within the organization, we want them to have a good time, have a good experience. So, you know, if it's giving away things um, like you would at a normal meetup or, um, you know, I, I'd really, I, I wanted to come to this session specifically so I could get better ideas on how to engage our audience more within the meetups, but also, you know, promoting them too. Um, so we're not selling anything during it. We just want more participation within our open source projects that we host, basically. So, you know, if you have ideas, I'm more than willing to listen. If I could jump in, um, we kind of found the same thing. Um, so. I kind of have this theory of um, if you are a brand, if you're a community, if you have any form of power uh, looking at your community in any way, shape or form, you could be the bear. Uh, you could like market a whole bunch of stuff. You could say, hey, here's our event. Hey, it's free. Hey, it's reduced cost. Hey, we have scholarships. Or you could be the flower and say, hey, we recognize things are difficult. We recognize things are hard. We're going to go ahead and pivot this event to something that's more regular to make sure that it matches your uh, schedule in this difficult time. And we have some resources and we have some content and we have some uh, merchandise that might be really, really um, good for you to have in lieu of not having the in-person experience. And then it was being the flower, having those resources and being there for the community members that I think led to a larger quality over quantity kind of feel at the event.
and we were looking at doing some of that too. So we we narrowed down our talks and and uh, to twenty minute talks because um, especially when you're online and you're already dealing with like Zoom fatigue or video fatigue, we narrowed it down. And there's a saying um, that uh, I forget who said it, but I said, you know, I would have made it longer, but I didn't have enough time, or I would have made it shorter, but I didn't have enough time. Because to narrow things down, you, okay, you gotta meet somebody here. Okay, um, you know, we we've got to, um, you know, you really got to think about how concise and crisp your message is going to be. So one of the things that we're looking at that we took from our big event was these 20 minute talks on how to expand them in webinars in 2021. So people want more information. They want to join the discussion. They want to do that. But we didn't want to have people on camera, you know, and have to sit in front of their camera for six to eight hours um, for a whole day. So we just made it, you know, four hours and said, here's what we'll do you know, um, in, in 2021, we'll take those popular talks and the, the stuff that people are asking for, and we'll move those to longer talks um, and that dialogue, you know, in, in 2021. So that's one of the ways that we kept people, um, I believe at any one time, anywhere from 250 to 400 and something people engaged at one time is because we did keep the talks short and sweet and people could pop in when they wanted to, they could ask their questions, you know, without, uh, any intimidation or anything from, um, you know, being on camera with, you know, experts or whatever. So we sort of removed, you know, that that piece of it. Um, I, I'm sure there's other other ways, um, but that was just one of the ways that we and and we didn't tell anybody that it was going to be recorded until the day of. So that drove it drove participation for the event um, instead of people going, oh, I'll catch the recording later. We didn't even mention that until after the after the no one actually so, watches the um, recordings later i have a pile of recordings that i'll get to eventually <laughs> but i think um, any, I, I any other thoughts on that it well you know aaron you're you're right um uh what was it mailchimp did a study i was doing design conferences a long time ago um uh about you know video usage and, and you know if they watch two minutes, you're lucky, um, unfortunately. And so, yes, we have, you know, we have 30 minute videos that we have on our website of all these events. I found actually though, that people will, they, we do a podcast that we record right after we do the meetups now with those same speakers and those podcasts get more traffic than the videos because people are willing to listen to the podcasts before they're willing to watch the video afterwards. Um, just FYI for more metrics. I also have like two things to say about that um, is I've noticed that if you um, market the on demands uh, with a somewhat tried and true email method system, and I know this sounds super marketing kind of Kung Fu, but if you do a, a, a plan and then a fear email where it's like, hey, this is available for you for the next nine months. And then you follow up with an email series that says, hey, you only have nine months, six months, three months, two weeks uh, to engage with this content. A lot of times setting that deadline will encourage them to engage a little bit more. But I think that Aaron is right. Um, I'm sorry, uh, it says Aaron, <laughs> but um, I think he's right. Uh, you should probably also look at splintering your on-demand content into other mediums that people are more willing to uh, watch or listen to over time. And also it's a great way to gain content for uh, later community generation. I think one of the things that Zeke Week did really well was to integrate Slack in with the conference in real time so that there were very short talks with no Q and A. And the idea was that like, go meet the presenter in Slack. So it drove people into that community very quickly and it made it a more interactive session. So to address kind of the Zoom fatigue and the, you know, do I just want to sit here and watch hours of talks? Uh, I, I have a very short amount of time to, to listen to a topic and say, oh, that sounds really interesting. Wait, I don't understand this. Or what about this? Let me go. There's already a, a conversation already happening in Slack. Uh, and then that can continue beyond uh, the, the event itself. Um, so I, I think that went extremely well. I think that went better than, than we could have ever anticipated. That's, that's really smart because I uh, inevitably we always get the requests um, of the chat for we have to use WebEx because 
it's needed for the the banks that's the one that they normally allow you to get through with um but you know the webex chat is, is probably the most requested thing out of um our our talks now um and because you know i mean and that means that there's good discussion um definitely but but i like the idea of throwing that into slack so that it can be i don't want to say ever or a little more evergreen but that that you can can we we also take the slides of the presenter and put them on linkedin um with the idea that people could continue the chat there um that hasn't really come to you know we've gotten some likes and everything but but for the most part i think you're right and i mean my slack's going crazy right now while i'm trying to speak of course but um but i think that if we would throw that into slack and then have something that they can continue to engage afterwards um that'd be awesome so thanks for that idea I really like that idea. Yeah, uh, just CTAing them to somewhat longer form content. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that went really well uh, that that so I've 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 had the privilege of doing this a few times with a few different conferences, and each one chose a different technology. So if I can geek out for a moment, one of the things that that I've seen work best is you know use uh, whatever you have to use. So if it's WebEx, if it's Zoom, if it's uh, <laughs> go to meeting, uh, whatever it might be for your presenters, but then make it as easy as possible for the attendees to join. And so by, for example, streaming to YouTube, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, oh, I can't, you know, I'm not allowed to install Zoom uh, or I don't have permissions or, you know, it's not a policy thing. It's just like you just click and watch YouTube and there's there's a live stream right there. So the attendees were, there's there's no barrier uh, to, to listening in on the talk. Now, presenters, obviously, we want to have more control and be able to screen share and do all those other things. So like for them, uh, having some, some more acceptable solution, whatever works for you, uh, you know, you'll need. But, but for the attendees, don't force them to use the same platform as the presenters. It's frankly, it's, it's really not necessary, especially once you communicate, once you separate the, the kind of Q&A and communication from the actual delivery of the, of the talk itself. We're in a regulated industry, so YouTube and like Google Docs and everything is, is so that that's you know we'd love to do that, um, but but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, sure. And then and Corey, I just saw your question. Um, so we <laughs> we just had a huge huge project announcement, open source project announcement this morning from Goldman Sachs through our platform plus. I'm here at CLS and all things open today, and we are concurrently running or at the same time running um, through a it's a financial regulator called air. Um, we are doing a hackathon this week on um, I'm not even sure what the the, um, the thing is called, but it, but basically it's cryptocurrency. Um, how to use cryptocurrency and how to fight against cryptocurrency that is being used in uh, children's sex trafficking. Um, and so we're, we're running a hackathon on that right now with AIR um, uh, using, but they are using Zoom. Um, so I can't be on, I, I'm on my phone for that one. I'm on my laptop for this one. Um, but, but what we're 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 trying to navigate the hackathon part um right now and so if we get anything out of that um you know and and i'd like to see how many attendees we have right now for that hackathon um but if we get anything out of it i will definitely relay it over to you um uh but this is this, yeah, this is new for us right now also yeah. And if I might also interject to kind of add to that, uh, Corey, I actually have a resource um, that I definitely recommend called Virtual Teams That Work. It's actually like this big uh, case study book of a bunch of peer review uh, articles. And I find that it's really, really helpful for the transition of ritual content events into virtual formats because they work very, very similar to um, active virtual teams. Um, I'm also going to add, and I sent a private message to Corey when she posted it, but there's a guy in Raleigh named Frank Jones. Um, he runs the Raleigh SEO meetup. 
He actually does it on Discord, but I would say about two thirds of his um, following and members um, are involved in a lot of hackathons for different things. And they, I believe they get together on Discord every Tuesday night. And I don't have access to the, um, uh, to the invite here, but if you go to the Raleigh SEO meetup on meetup.com, you can join it. And then the invite link is there. Um, and I can, I'm gonna post my email address publicly in your chat. And if you shoot me an email, I can forward you his last email to it. But his group, there's probably 15 of them. They can probably provide advice in that space because a lot of them are involved with that stuff. And, and to, to echo Eugene, Discord is, is a fantastic tool. I actually was very much opposed to it um, a few months ago. And uh, uh, DEF CON, which is one of the largest security conferences in the world, if not the, uh, hosted their virtual conference in, in Discord. And I was floored to see how well it, it handled. Um, it allowed for screen sharing. It allowed for you know the quick formation of rooms, for uh, for moderation from the organizers, while at the same time having freedom for the participants to you know self organize. So for something like a hackathon, uh, something like Discord, where you can have you know just some some rooms that people can just kind of jump in and work on their project and screen. You know you can have multiple screen shares going. You can have your cameras on or off. Um, it worked beautifully, and I've and I've, I've honestly done a total 180 on Discord. Uh, so for a free tool, uh, it's a, it's fantastic. It's a very low barrier to entry. A lot of uh, younger folks, I think, are already familiar with it anyway. Um, and uh, for a hackathon setting, I think it'd be fantastic. I'm in like 20 discords it, now. It, it's it 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 catches up with you very quickly. <laughs> I used to use it for D &D. the other thing that Aaron does. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm done. It was an aside. I, I use Discord a lot or dis yeah, I use Discourse, Discord. Both of them are wonderful platforms, but I use Discord a lot for D&D &D sessions and it's incredibly handy for uh, working with other people. The, the other thing Aaron does really well that is not a hackathon, but it is a hands-on kind of like multiple people where you need multiple rooms, that kind of stuff. Aaron runs a, um, a CTF for both um, our our corporate organization and our community and um, and now with with some of the zoom um, uh, when you upgrade when people can move between breakout sessions and stuff it makes it super easy to set up a whole bunch of breakouts and let people move in in between those breakouts too so depending on what tools you already have if you don't want to go out and invest engineering debt or you know that tech debt setting something up and learning something new and you already have a tool then th it might be be uh, just upgrading your license for the for the, the meeting side to hold more people and hold, have more breakout rooms. So and and Aaron runs some very successful and often large CTFs um, in that format in that format as as well. Um, one of the questions that came up was about tooling. Um, uh, let's see where did it go. Um, questions we haven't hit yet. Uh, what are the recommended tools? Uh, what's a good way to determine the level of interest in the event? So I was going to post this little checklist that I have um, and I'll and I'll post it later to um, uh, in the Google Doc. But let me see if I can post it here. So um, one of the things that that I try to do for every event, doesn't matter how big or small, is one survey the community. You map out the community and find your you know, your influencers, your, we are talking about the mission statement, what the content is, and then what your budget is. Sometimes you can do big events. I've done, you know, 4,000 people in person events on a $2,500 budget, but that took a lot of work. Um, you know, your day and location, and then finally it's your marketing piece. You gotta have all your other pieces in place to do marketing. So uh, we're talking Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so, um, so it just depends on like, one, what, what your budget is and how, how much you can spend on your tools, or do you find out that, you know what, we can, we only have five grand to do everything with. And so what do you, what are you going to use? So it all depends a lot of times on how much budget do you have, you know, to find your tools and your location or, you know, what, or if it's in, you know, virtual, you know, um, what do you already have um, and how much are people going to let you spend? So I don't know any other thoughts about, uh, um, those right tools and, and where you pull the trigger on different things. Um, 
One of my favorite tools, and this kind of also gets to another question that was on the Google Doc that we haven't quite gotten to, is how do you gauge interest in people's um, in people who are interested in your event prior to your event actually happening? Um, and one of my favorite tools, I uh, discovered this in 2019 uh, at CMX, um, the Community um, Leadership Summit for CMX. And uh, it's by happily.io and it's a ROI calculator that I've included in the set. And a portion of that calculator is um, after the event, but at least beforehand you can say, okay, so these are the integers. These are the key performance indicators that I need to be tracking regularly in order to get an estimated amount of uh, cost. And it boils it down to really simple. Uh, if you're not getting a four times ROI as a result of the calculator, um, then it might not be worth running your virtual event. At the same time, there's that aspect of quality greater than uh, quantity. So that's an incredibly useful tool. I had, I had heard of it, but I haven't played around with it. So. Sorry. Oh. I was just gonna say I was the one who asked that question or asked that question in the uh, the document regarding the you know ROI um, because it's one of those where when you uh, go to host an event it's it's determining how many people actually want to participate in the event um, and sometimes that's really hard to gauge um, you know because it seems like some people could be really interested in an event and then when you actually have the event only like three people show up here so it's like okay what are what you know what am I doing wrong? Or is it, you know, how, how am I misjudging the audience in such a way that like I, the, the ROI becomes negative for every event and that's just not sustainable. So, you know, it's one of those tricky kind of things where you want people to come to an event, but you also don't want to be pushy and send a whole bunch of emails and notifications and stuff. So. Mike, do you find, I mean, do you do registration for your event? First of all, um, so we, uh, so I have done registration uh, uh, once before. Um, it was basically uh, uh, the event that I was trying to put together, uh, and I did uh, successfully once, was based off of a meetup group. Um, and so it was more of the, uh, you know, the people who were in the meetup and communicating with that group of people about the, you know, about the event that was outside the, the meetup. And then, you know, the the level of interest seemed high and then the level of attendance uh, was uh, shockingly low. So um, either people really don't like me or um, it just they just didn't really want to go. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it's the latter and not the former, but, you know, I mean, you know, people well, be cool and all. I think one of the biggest, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I think ahead, one of the things that you should do is you should do some funnel optimization. So uh, figure out what's going on in your funnel and where people are dropping off. And I was going to say that um, with, with the meetups that we've done, we, is, it, is that the one? We require registration um, just so that so we could get an idea of who might be interested and that's our way of gauging interest. Um, however, I don't ever announce the, the full event until the day before. Um, and because it, it is one thing to promote an event for months on end and get, you know, plenty of interest in it. But, but I think what you're talking about, Mike, is that it's, it's another thing to actually have somebody show up. And, and I've been getting a lot of things from like HubSpot and, and other places that I follow that, you know, they're like, you can promote it all you want, but in, unless those people know and remember on the day of or the day before that there's supposed to be someplace, um, then they just won't, you know, they won't show up. Um, people don't read, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> people don't remember. And, and then when it's, when there's, uh, back to Aaron's point about if there's going to be a recording anyway, why do I care? You know, I can just come back to, or I think I'm going to come back to it. Um, but you know, because it's virtual and because, you know, like when, when Todd and I were doing, um, uh, PostCon, uh, 10 something years ago, um, 
our biggest problem was with students. We'd let them in for free and they would either, you know, register and we'd look like we had these incredible numbers and they'd not show up or they'd just, you know, come in and steal all the swag from the sponsors and then, you know, go away. Um, but once we actually, you know, made them pay 10 bucks for the event, we saw the right number of attendees come in. And so, so sometimes the registration so that you can send them something that says, Hey, don't forget, you know, there, we send out the mass email saying there's an event tomorrow, but we send a reminder email about an hour and a half before the event saying, don't forget, you said you were going to come to this, um, with, with a calendar invite to, um, you know, give, give them every, you know, chance not to mess it up, unfortunately. And, and it may feel like you're, you're over communicating to them. Um, but I, I, after working with Todd Lewis for a long time, I can tell you, he, he's the king of over communication in a good way. Um, and, and people show up because he continues to over communicate and, and it, when it feels like it's too much, when there's so much noise coming through, you know, chat, through email, through everything else, sometimes you just, you kind of have to be pushy. Otherwise they're not going to come to your event. And it's not you. And I'll, I'll echo team Aaron. Exactly. Very quickly. Uh, if you, but more emails, not less. Calendar invites are big. Uh, so I've run about 50 different of these capture the flag events. And I've noticed kind of a little bit of AB testing as we added calendar invites, like people add it to their calendar and they remember that's huge. Um, I have included like an RSVP link just to say like, Hey, just want to make sure you're going to come click here to claim your seat. Uh, so that gives them a little bit of urgency to it, but it also gives me uh, a click a trackable link that I can say like, all right, I know they saw this email, they clicked on it, they acted on it. Um, so I'll say, you know, click to claim your seat, add this to your calendar, uh, and then join us uh, on these dates. And then the last thing that I would add to that, um, and I think Amber's done a great job of this, is, is finding a way to make it, make incentivize the live event. So give a prize away potentially if there's if there's some competitive aspect or, or you know even just a raffle something uh, to say like oh well I should I should be there for that or make it so that you could you're really going to only be able to ask questions if you show up to the live event and of course we want to ask questions so whatever you can do to incentivize them to be there um, at that time um, I think really does help. And we're just going to go for a couple more minutes since we got got a late start. The other thing I was going to say was never never take it personal because as a kind of a rule of thumb when it comes to online events and in person events, um, especially online free, just if you've got a hundred people registered, just assume fifty are going to show up. Like if that fifty percent attrition rate is pretty standard for online free events. Um, now when you when people you know have to register and there's just a little bit of skin in the game like whether it's that ten dollars or whether it's some you know little fee that that's associated that somebody has to pay or 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 uh you know put into it then that's usually about a 30 percent attrition rate because some people can go i can afford to lose that amount of money because it's not like a you know twenty six hundred dollar registration fee but you still see attrition even with those larger numbers so figure like when you look at the numbers for in-person attrition versus online attrition, always just the, you know, assume 50% attrition for an online free event. Um, and then if you get more than that, then you're happily um, surprised. Um, we've got about two minutes before, you know, we call this uh, done um, and we move on to like the next, uh, the next talk. But um, is there anything else that you'd like or questions that we should put answers to in the Google Doc that maybe we haven't gotten to yet, please put those in there and we'll do our best to answer them before the end of the day um, and, and get that uh, get that taken care of. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on or something that you thought we were going to touch on that you um, that we didn't um, that we that we can ask here and then follow up in the Google Doc. No. So, but if there is, I feel like there's so much more. Like I just put that short checklist in there. The other thing that I'll include too in the Google Doc is a master event tracker. So one of the things that people 
often don't do is have a, a spreadsheet that's got all your revenue coming in, all your costs to include T and E for your project, breaking down your registration by type and how much each type costs and then what have you got coming in. And then also tracking your sponsors on another sheet, tracking your shipping. It seems like a lot of detail, but tracking that shipment for all your sponsors, what your sponsors ordered, what, what they actually got delivered. All of those type of things affect your bottom line and your budget. So making sure that um, you do have a great master um, event tracker. Um, and I'll include, a, I'll try to clear out one that I think is really good and, and drop a link to a blank one um, on the Google Doc. If I don't get it done by our wrap up session at five, then I'll, I'll do it tonight so everybody has it. Um, and I'll also put that other checklist in there and all the questions that um, you kind of need to go over when you're planning either of in-person or um, an online event, you know, who you're meeting with your stakeholders, collaborating, coming up with a plan and then executing to that plan. A lot of people come up with a plan, then they change the plan halfway through and then wonder how come things didn't go um, as you had expected because there was too many changes in flight. So, um, but we'll include all of that um, as well. And then we'll also include, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, how to evaluate impact outside of uh, vanity numbers. Um, yes, we'll go ahead. Well, matter of fact, I'm going to be calculating that my event next week. So as I do that, I'll add those um, stats in there as well. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for everybody for joining.